This time on Graveyard Cars. Oh, 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 oh. Back up, back up. Mark and Darren build the Hemi for the 1970 Charger. I'm wow. going to let nothing come between us. Everybody go? I don't know how much more of Mark I can take. Royal and I tear apart the K member in preparation. I want to get this done, ready to go back together before Mark gets the motor done. And then we team up to paint and fire up the Hemi engine for the first time in over 30 years. This thing's called the elephant for a reason, stupid. On this episode of Graveyard Cars. Got that car coming to get you, I'm Mark Warman, and together with the most critical man in the world, Darren Kirkpatrick. Give me a gun! My son-in-law, Josh. Oh, yeah! And my best friend, Roy. Well, all right! We bring dead muscle cars back to life to exactly the way they were on the day they were born. If we don't kill each other. There. Oh. 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 It's gonna be a bloodbath. Here's a great example. Great show, guys. Love the Mopars. Darren is a pain in the ass. Get rid of him. Love watching the show. If I take another two seconds of Darren, I'm going to veer into oncoming traffic. Darren is possibly the biggest pain in the ass the entire world has ever known. Get rid of him. Why does he want to drive Royals Jeep? Darren. I should elaborate that and put it in a sentence. Um, I agree with everybody else. The show is great, but too much childlike behavior, and it all stems from Darren and his immature attitude. Get rid of Darren. I can't do this anymore. This is too much for me. I'm trying really hard to do a good job, and, to, and all I'm getting is backlash. What? The Hemi is on the engine stand. Great, let's go. I've been waiting no. for it to get done. Oh. Three foot rule, bro. No. Three foot rule. You got the tools out there, buddy? What are you so gung-ho about? I've been waiting a long time for this. What are you talking about? Mark just gave me a, gave me a little talk since I'm doing great. Since the last time you saw us on Graveyard Cars, we've made a lot of progress on some of the cars in the shop, as well as took time to enjoy the holiday season. The city of Springfield made the obvious choice in selecting the Graveyard Ghouls and yours truly to lead the 61st annual Springfield Christmas Parade. The Ghouls and I were joined by the mayor herself and the city council. This was a great opportunity to show off the cars from last season, as well as have some great fun. As everybody knows, we're constantly improving the shop and the equipment so that we're able to do the best restoration possible. So recently, I purchased an Auto Body Buddy lift, and after the purchase, Tom came out from the company and helped me set it up and show me the exact ways to make the pulls with this particular piece of equipment. We've been manufacturing frame machine and unibody equipment for since 1980. After 15 years of frame machines, we realized it's not the answer anymore in the body shop today. So we invented a machine here that we can use on any car that comes in the door, 10 out of 10, regardless of what you're doing. We've built a very unique machine in that it's just three inches thick and lays flat on the floor. Stays out of your way, doesn't type a lot of shop space. We just gained about 400 square feet in the shop that we didn't have before, and every single square inch counts in this business. We also got a lot of work done on Mark and Elena's 1970 FE5 Rally Red Cuda. We installed the grill, front bumper, tail lights, rear bumper. We got the exterior door handles and some exterior trim on. And a lot of other little things have been done on Mark and Elena's 70 Cuda 383 that push us that much closer to the finish line. While you were gone, I put the 400 together for the 72 Charger. Got the 340 sent out, it's back, it's ready to go together. I got the Hemi on the stand, it's ready to go together. All the machine work, all the nuts, the bolts, all the fasteners are set out while you guys were playing house. I actually never really felt like I left in the first place. You know, my mind's always been here. We're all buddies. Now that the idiots are back from vacation and recess, we can refocus, get our nose to the grindstone, and start pumping out some of these cars. The plan is to divide and conquer and get things done. Instead of having four monkeys work, on the same car, split us up into two groups of two monkeys working on the cars. Darren and I are working on the 426 Hemi for the 70 Charger RT, and Josh and Royal are actually working on the front suspension and K-member for the 70 Charger RT. Let's get this one motor done, nothing else matters, get it done, focus all of our attention on it. You get that done, get all your attention on it. Next thing you know, we're gonna have all these pieces done. So you know what, and that's the other thing I wanna really try to do. I told you guys I was gonna do a little soul searching while you were gone. <laughs> How'd that go? Mark's speech today is the same as it's been every other year. You're gonna work with me, don't stare off. No, I, I'm, on making I'm us just a happier, more positive, 
group of people. He's telling us what we want to hear, and the first given moment, he's going to put us all down like he has been. He's quite proud of himself with his names and stuff that he calls us. The only thing I want to do before we get started here is I want to make sure that you, I get certain things out of my system. I've noticed you grew an extra set of eyelashes that go between your actual eyelid and your second set of eyebrows. Did I? You, you're even more bald, and you actually have a low spot right here that needs a little bit of Bondo and a block <laughs> sand. <laughs> You look like Yukon Cornelius from Rudolph. Oh, Rudolph! Wow. Welcome back. <laughs> right now I'm out in the body shop with the guys. They're putting together the rear body section on the 70 Charger RT. This is really cool stuff to show, and that's why I wanted to get the guys out here. We have an electronic measuring system by Eclipse. It allows me to measure within a millimeter exactly where a frame rail, exactly where a panel goes. So I know that the car is geometrically square. We can record that data, and then we can use it on the next car. So we get another car that's wadded up to the windshield. We know that we can set those targets in place, go back and look and see where it's supposed to be, and we no longer have to trial and fit. We just put it back to where it belongs, and we're done. That's why we use the Eclipse measuring system. You've heard the term unibody. These are unibody cars. They're a frame and sheet metal combination, and that's what makes up the structural integrity. Right now, I'm looking at this car, and I see a beautifully flat rear cross member. And the Eclipse probably should be showing the exact same thing. And now, we, when I X from the front to the very rear that we just put in, yep. we're within oh, three millimeters. Here's his level setting in the back. And you can see right now that probably one millimeter or so up on this side is going to make that level go perfectly flat. If we didn't have the sheet metal right now from AMD, and that's the point of it, you've got to have it. AMD makes restoration parts. In this particular case, this car would have been probably totaled if I hadn't been able to buy that sheet metal from Auto Metal Direct. It would have, because I'd have had to go buy a whole nother car, and nobody's giving a whole nother car away for five or 10 grand. They're wanting 30 or 40 grand for a car that you're gonna cut up. Three and three, nice. Yeah, yeah we're good on the height. Okay, it's perfect. Make it, uh, make it happen, build me a house. Make it beautiful. Now that Mark has signed off on the foundation, we're ready to go ahead and get the sheet metal on the car. This season on Graveyard Cars, we have a ton of restorations, but we are out of time and we're out of space. Our first priority is Mark and Elena's 1970 Plymouth Cuda 383 automatic. We also have Kimberly Cook's 1970 Barracuda convertible 383 two barrel to finish. It's been painted, parts have been cleaned and ready for final assembly. Also in the shop is the 1970 Plymouth Superbird 444 barrel. We have been working on this car since season two and we have all the AMD sheet metal in place. Bodywork is done, it's been final primed, and it's now ready for paint. Yellow 72 Dodge Charger that belongs to Jim and Mitzi truthfully is not one of my favorite cars here at Graveyard Cars. Even though it's more of a big yellow boat than a car, it still has a great story behind it. Also coming through is the most recognizable Mopar in television history, the world famous 1969 Dodge Charger General Lee. This is only the tip of the iceberg. Still waiting in the queue are some of the rarest and most iconic Mopar muscle cars Chrysler ever built. At Graveyard Cars, we're not just bringing cars back from the dead, we're bringing them back exactly the way they were made on the assembly line the day they were produced. We bring history back one legend at a time. And that's Graveyard Cars. This is the original numbers matching block. There's a big dent inside the K-member. I don't think it's the same car. He's got the attention span of a chipmunk. We're back from vacation with new toys, new cars, and new sheet metal. Today we're working on the 1970 Dodge Charger RT. Darren and I are building the short block Hemi, and while we're doing that, Josh and Royal have got to get the K-member and the suspension torn down. Come on, Josh! This is a K-member for the 70 Hemi Charger. We need to get it cleaned up while Mark and Darren are working on the motor so that it'll be ready when they're done. Here he comes. Beautiful Oregon rainy day, Royal. 
If we leave it out there long enough, it will wash itself. Yeah. I just want to heat the water up. Before we can sandblast this thing, we have to get all the grease completely off of it. If we don't get all the grease off of it, it's going to cause little balls of grease to, to start balling up and getting clogged inside of the sandblaster, and that's going to cost a lot of time. So we're out here. We've got the Aladdin pressure washer. we got the heat cranked all the way up. It's just going to take that grease right off, just like cutting right through butter. You know, it, it's actually really beneficial that Royal's here today doing this because I've been cleaning the last countless amounts of K members and front suspension parts, and you get completely soaked. Now he gets to see what it's like. Josh usually does the power washing. I just, I like to do it once in a while. Josh is finishing up where all, where all I missed. Although I don't think I missed any of myself. I want to get this done, get it apart, get it ready to go back together before Mark gets the motor done. Hey, Royal, we're done, buddy. Today we're putting together the 426 Hemi for the 1970 Dodge Charger RT. The machine shop has done all the work on the engine. It just came back a couple of days ago. So I just did a little bit of fine tuning and fine cleaning on it. And now we're gonna start, me and Tweedledum here, gonna start putting together the short block. You know, I've never worked on a 426 Hemi engine before, so that's gonna be exciting. The Street Hemi became available in 1966. You now this is a 1970 426 Hemi engine. Again, I know not much about it, but I'm sure with Mark and the books, you know, we'll get it together right and I'll learn a lot. This is the original numbers matching block. These are the last eight characters of the VIN number of the 70 Charger RT. That's what we mean when we say an original numbers matching block. The VIN number matches the VIN number of the car. The first thing that we're going to put in the engine is the crankshaft. And before we put the crankshaft in, we have to put the main bearings in place. So these, these main bearings, just like the rod bearings, have these actual tabs right here. So you'll see the tab there. You'll notice this one has no hole in it. This one has the hole. And the tab is there, and the tab is there. So we know that it goes down here. Push it down into place. And it, did I lose you already? No, I just went to get another one. That's the shortest attention span I've ever seen. I wasn't done. So this is the top half mm -hmm. one. This needs to go in the top cap. We should probably do that now. So here is the main cap. Again, this has no oil journals in it, right? This one has no oil journals in it. Should this go in there like that? Where are the notches? OK, so the notch is there. That notch is there. That's going to go down in there like that. And like that. And now that center main cap has the bearing in it. We don't have to wonder where it is or where it went to. So we can just, since we're going to be using it pretty soon, let's just set it there. So we have the front, which is represented by the F. Can't get that messed up. That goes at the front of the block. Why are you doing you this? You got them out of order. I wasn't done. I was. This is the front one. So it'll end up going down here at the front, like that. Once the crankshaft is installed, this will be two, this will be three, this will be four, and this will be rear. Now that we have it all cleaned up, we'll get it in here, look for any production marks that we can find. We're gonna go ahead and disassemble everything on this. You know, obviously everything is completely rusted over, so we're gonna make some noise, we're gonna make a mess, but after we get done disassembling everything off of here, we're gonna get it organized. We'll take it through and start getting all the bushings taken out of everything, and after that process is done, then we'll start the sandblasting. So it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of a long process, but it's worth it. It's going pretty good without Mark here. Nice job, Royal. OK. Just we're running out of space. Yep, too many cars, not enough time, not enough space and time to do them in. Now we're ready to set the actual crankshaft down in there. Make sure you use an assembly lube of some sort. I like to be plentiful, because you're not going to hurt anything by being plentiful. So we're going to set the crankshaft in now. I got it kind of backwards. That's OK, Mary, I don't need your help. I'm sorry. I wasn't going to call you Mary. <laughs> I always just like to check everything. As you put it together, you keep checking how easy it rotates. Instead of putting the whole thing together, rotating it, find out it doesn't rotate, what would you end up doing? Taking everything, everything back apart until it did. Why. This way you go right, one good, piece good. at a time. So these are the main caps. So Darren, feel free to start putting your own in. Just put them in by numbers. This has got an F on it. That would be the front, yep. So right now, it looks to me like all the main caps are resting. They're not bolted in, certainly, but they are resting. 
Okay, so what we want to do is just make sure these are down into place before we put our cross bolts in. So I'm just putting about 10 pounds on them is all. So a little something to make sure that they're seated against the actual block itself. 50. How close do you think you'd get if you had to 50. guess it though? They just sort of. I think I'd get pretty close. 50. You're having trouble, we get Josh to do that for you to 100 pounds. I don't think I need his help. I believe that we are a team that works together to save old Mopars, and I think we'll always be a team. N I'm wow. gonna let nothing, <laughs> nothing come between us. Wow. See if that engine rotates. Feel like, good? Like margarine. Chrysler introduced the 426 Hemi Street version in 1966. By 1971, it had exited the scene. During those years, what induction system was used on all of those engines? Was it the single 950 CFM Holley carburetor, the 446 pack induction system, or dual AFB carburetors? The answer coming up after the break. So what was the original induction system used on all 66 to 71 street Hemis? Well, the Holly six-pack setup was only available on the 340 and the 440. The 383, 440, and 340 would have been a single four-barrel in any other application. That would have left only the inline dual four AFB as the induction system used on all 66 to 71 street Hemis. Visit graveyardcars.com to learn more. Royal and Josh are cleaning up and tearing down the K-member for the 70 Charger RT in record time. Darren and I have been getting along famously while we're building out the Hemi. Next on the list, we're gonna install the pistons. Here's what I wanna do, I start putting the pistons in right now. Once the piston's gone below the deck height, that means the rings are seated down into the cylinder itself. I'm gonna press that piston in further until that rod bearing that you saw us shoot grease on butts up against this rod journal. Then we'll put the cap on it with some lube and it'll be ready to torque down. Sounds nice. That's it, huh? Everything's been going great this morning. Things have been working out perfect, getting a lot done. Out of the blue, Darren decides he's gonna play the game. There you go, back, back, back. Oh, oh, this thing's gotta be rotated that. That's why the bar's on there, Tiger. You put it anywhere you want. They're not gonna rotate it that way. You're gonna rotate it with this. I used to be able to count all the crazy things that Darren was, but he just adds to it every day. It's gotten to a point where I can't keep track of it. Trying to rotate a crankshaft with your hand. Why? I, I mean, Superman couldn't do it. Why are you trying to do it? God, what position, really? What position do you want it in, buddy? Farthest away, perfect. Shit, on Friday. It is Friday. God. Miracle. Nope. 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 What? Comes up solid, it sounds like. That's the game. Shove a stick of dynamite up my ass. It's like Bugs Bunny. You idiot. What's wrong with you? See the rod bearing laying down inside the block? There's no bearing on it. That was your whole job, was just to make sure that that bearing. That was my that whole block. job? More make me look bad, right? You're trying to change this. You remember? did it yourself, bud. I drove the pistons in there. The whole reason I'm having Darren help me on the Hemi is because he wanted to learn, and I know he's detail-oriented. Why he isn't paying attention to the one and only thing that I'm having him do is beyond me. It's not my fault the bearing fell out. It was my fault that I didn't notice the bearing had fallen out, but it's probably being belittled by Mark at the time where I didn't even notice it. All you had to do is make sure the bearing stayed. first time without shaking like, a, like an That's earthquake. That's what it was? Really? Yeah, like an earthquake. That's what? Yeah. Did anybody go? What's wrong? Well, you know, this is just not going to stop overnight with Mark because, you know, you're just like a marathon runner, you don't start running the marathon your first day. You start out by maybe running half mile. You know, this is all because of you, so you should yeah, shut the Yeah, I know it is. Okay, Mark. In all actuality, I'm helping Mark build up a tolerance to myself so that we'll all get along better at Graveyard Cars. You could have took the piston clear out, but... but yeah. F*** off. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Josh, let me teach you something. I don't know if Josh and Mark has showed you this or not. Yeah, I, I like disassembling this stuff. It's, you know, it's just kind of a rip and tear, and then take your time putting it back together. Make sure you got it right. Let's look a little burnt. See how they're discolored? So would that mean just using these brakes too much, or? 
Well, they could have been over Titan. Real and I always get along. He doesn't sit there and belittle me like Darren and Mark. And on top of that, he's showing me new tricks without yelling at me. Ah, imagine that. Potato, french fries. Don't say that around Mark, you'll make him hungry. <laughs> Oh, nice. Yep. I'm trying to feel if there's any kind of resistance. If you don't do that, and you have one that's too tight in there, it'll spin that bearing instantly as soon as the engine starts up. I always like to check the journals. I mean, just in case you've got a Josh or a Darren or a Royal working in your plant, and they drop the box and chip the edge of the journal. I want to just take a look at it, make sure it's all butamous. The Hemi camshafts from the factory used three bolts that held the timing gear to it where a 440 and the regular wedge engines used one single bolt, which was a 5 8 head. This actually uses three, representing the extra torque and the extra horsepower. So from here, we're just gonna very carefully, not to hit those cam bearings, we're gonna just float it through there. Just be very careful not to nick those. They have a coating on them. There we go, and we are in. Camshaft is installed, so next thing we have to put on is the timing chain and gear set. There are timing marks that have to be lined up. So you can see that that mark there is straight in line with that mark there. But you see all the time you're, you're, you're in check. Perfect alignment. That is when you hear people refer to, and I've referred to it, top dead center. First thing that has to go on, this is called an oil slinger. It's gonna grab hold of this. It's gonna slosh it around and help keep the cam shaft, crank shaft, and timing chain lubed out here. Next component is our timing cover. There are four larger and four smaller bolts, Darren. And I have a feeling you're gonna knock them all over before you even start looking, right? This is a 426 Hemi. 440, 426 Hemis, and 340s all used a windage tray. And because this goes in there, you need an extra set of gaskets. So now we're just gonna set this down on there. Let's put the oil pump on since it's upside down. Done. I, I still don't agree with you about this being the same car, same engine and everything, that car that Tony saw. What are you talking about? I don't think it's the same car. It's got to be the same it car. They made have... 56 of them. So that means there's 55 other ones. You know, it was shortly after we got the 70 Charger from New York, the Hemi car, that I got the call from Tony talking about the fact that he used to go over and knock on this guy's door and try to buy the car all the time from when he was a little kid. And uh, I've been sharing that story with Darren. And he cannot, in his mind, he cannot grasp the idea that Tony has no reason to make that story up. No, I didn't call him a liar. Go call him. He's got a bad memory. Call him. The whole made up story about the 70 Hemi Charger being the same vehicle that Tony saw somewhere past in his childhood or a dream or something, I still don't believe it. I'm tired of your games, man. Not a game, Mark. I mean, I'm tired of these stories you come up with just to relate it back to Raveyard Cars somehow. Uh, it's all about you and right Tony. Right now, now. It's all about you. Again, it's you about you. I'm coming, Mark. Well, it looks like I'm by myself now. Uh, Royal had to take off to go to his other job, which is totally cool. So the first thing that I'm gonna go ahead and sandblast is gonna be the K-member. When these things are completely covered in rust, you can't see anything, but after you get done blasting it, you can see it all. Well, I just got done blasting over one general spot and there's a big dent inside the K-member. But I don't know, my guess is it, it either rammed into something or something rammed into it. Boy, I cannot be thankful enough for these metal awnings. You take a look outside right now, man, it's a monsoon. It, it's like this, 24 seven here in Oregon. It just rains, 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 rains. I'd be drenched. Mark wouldn't care. Mark loves to see people miserable. I mean, honestly, you don't see him over here sandblasting. You know why? Because he's got the attention span of a chipmunk. These valve covers were actually on the engine when it went orange. No matter what I do, it seems like I do it wrong. Oh, 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 back up, back up. Graveyard Cars has just received one of the rarest Chrysler muscle cars ever made anywhere, anytime. 1970 Dodge Coronet RT 426 Hemi four-speed convertible. They built two of them. You're looking at one. Let's check it out. In 1970, 
Dodge Belt 2 Coronet RT Convertibles option with the 426 Hemi. What's your problem? No, no, I'm just This is one of the two. This one was exported to Canada. The other one stayed in the United States. This is a pistol grip console shift four speed. You're just jealous because they made 916 a year and they only made two of these. How many yours did they make? Doesn't matter. You are. This car is the rarest car so far to come to graveyard cars for total production numbers. We've had them that were one of one, one of two, but that's after you break down the colors and the options. This is only one of two cars ever built. It was restored 10 years ago. It's back to be restored right. Graveyard cars is what we do. Nice face. Josh and Royal completely disassembled the K-member for the Hemi Charger. Royal took off for his existential job, leaving Josh to start media blasting the K-member and suspension pieces. Meanwhile, Darren and I got the pistons, camshaft, timing chain, oil pan, oil pump all installed in the Hemi. And just when I thought we were getting along, Darren starts playing the game. Now I gotta go call Tony D'Agostino and settle an argument. Call him right now. What is wrong with you? can't wait. I can't wait either. So I called Tony right up, got the jack-eyed weasel in there on the phone, and let Tony explain to him that he used to live in Highland Mills, same town. What are the odds, right? What are the odds that he used to leave a, a business card on another 70 Hemi Charger? Hello, Tony Smoke for our T is Mark. Hey, how you doing, bud? It's a better chance that I'll like Darren by the end of the year than there is that he would go up and knock on another door and have it be a different 1970 Dodge Charger 426 Hemi four-speed burnt orange with a black top and black interior. I don't know. A little over a month or so ago, I was talking with one of my friends, and he has a memory like a vice, and he said, do you think that Hemi Charger they have out there is that one we used to look at up in New York there that you knew about? So I asked Mark, and he goes, yep, yeah, that's where the car is from, Highland Mills. I don't think it's a different car. So it's the, it is possible, though, right? That is a great example of who Darren is. You can give him all of the proof in the world for something, but in his mind, if he doesn't want to believe it, he's not going to believe it. And even if he does believe it, the whole goal is to throw you off. That is an element of the game. His sister and himself had both been in contact with me. They noticed my business card, that his dad had uh, saved my business card, and they still had it in the house. You know, Tony is the smartest Mopar individual I've ever met as far as facts, figures, and parts, et cetera. But I still don't believe that's the same car Tony saw back in his childhood and his youth. So it's not the same car. You know, that's a great example of why Darren is great to have around the shop. And the only reason is he's pessimistic. He finds the bad, the negative, the impossible in everything. So to not believe Tony and to not believe that scenario only plays into who his character is. So having him QC something is great because it's, it has to be perfect or it's not going to get past Darren. <laughs> I don't think it's the same car. Yeah, it's looking a lot better now. We got a couple more spots left on here. Concentrate on the big rust spots. In areas like this right here where there's all the pits, you have to hold the blasting gun point blank with it and slowly work your way up and down so that you can get all the rust out of there because if you don't, you're gonna eventually have to take the paint off if you put paint on it. Take the paint off, re-blast re it because that rust is just gonna continue to spread. All right, I'm gonna put this back in, get this thing done. So we have our cylinder heads on and they're torqued to spec. We have our rocker arm assemblies in place and the valves are set to spec. So really where we're at now is to install the intake manifold next. After that, we can put the water pump, water pump housing on, valve covers, and move this out to the booth so we can get some color on it. Tell me where the front and where the back of this intake is. You know, I understand Mark's the boss and I'm just trying to help out around here, but no matter what I do, it seems like I do it wrong. I'm just trying to help out. You have to tap him with a hammer. I want you to shut up. The guy that makes suggestions, the guys that runs it for everybody. I don't know how much more of Mark I can take. I need a little, uh, little hammer. <laughs> nice. Got it? Looks like it. All right. Let's put some bolts in that mother. Now that we have the factory dual four intake manifold in place on the 426 Hemi, the two throttle return brackets, dual fours, and the throttle return bracket itself, we can actually torque everything down with an inch pound torque wrench to spec and move on to the next step. Yeah, These go to 72. I thought you to make sure this one was tight. Could we go to the center and just do all of them again? Yeah. That's what I was saying and the book was saying. 72. That's up to you, because you may know more than that damn book. I don't think so. <laughs> Most of the Mopar engines came with cast iron intakes on them, but a few did come with aluminum intakes. And one of the main problems with aluminum intake is you can over tighten it and actually warp the engine, which will cause a vacuum leak and or an oil leak. Done. Interesting. 
The 426 Hemi, even though the valve cover is a wrinkle black and the rest of the engine is Hemi orange, these valve covers were actually on the engine when it went orange. So what you see to be an OEM correct is this got masked off. Well, we know human beings are masking it off. There's a thing called an undermask and an overmask. Undermasking would be, one of the two existed, goes to mask it off, and he doesn't quite go all the way down to that lip, right? He's in a hurry, he's super guy. He's gotta get out, there's all kinds of crazy stuff happening tonight. So he's gonna run that around there, he's gonna run that around there. He's sloppy, he's got 50 of these to paint. So what's gonna happen is the bottom of that little rung is gonna end up with some Hemi orange on it. That would be an OE correct. If he overmasked it, he would go past the valve cover onto the block. So then when you pulled it all off after painting it, you'd have a spot of bare metal right there where it got overmasked. So I'm going to try to do a good job that still shows some OEM intent when I do it. We try when we can to emulate the way the assembly line did it. That's how the assembly line did it. The size of that valve cover gasket. Let's give you an example. That's a Hemi valve cover gasket. Here's the valve cover for the 440. There's the valve cover for the 426 Hemi. This thing's called the elephant for a reason. You see the footprint it takes up? You stick that thing into a CUDA, which has no room inside the engine compartment, and then you try to put a power brake booster on it. That power brake booster rides right here. You ain't gonna get a valve cover off with a power brake booster on. Looking good, gentlemen. Looking good. And one of these does not have a lock washer on it right now, Mark. That's fine. I just want to get it seated down there, then we'll go through the hardware and make sure we have everything right. If, and if you need to, like, if you need to bombard your way around and knock me down, don't worry about it. You're like that old bat in the, in the grocery store with that shopping cart. She's dangerous. <laughs> All she's got her eyes on that 19 cent can of clam chowder, man. She's gonna knock you down. Ain't nothing gonna get in your way. You ask her why, because I'm old. Good answer. We sealed the gasket to the valve covers, installed the valve covers. The water pump got installed and sealed as well as the thermostat housing and gasket. The second generation Dodge Charger is the most abused vehicle in all of Hollywood. From the 68 Charger in Bullet, to the General Lee, to the 70 Charger that was used in Fast and Furious. True or false, they selected these vehicles because the Charger was the only full frame vehicle that was available at the time. The answer coming up after the break. Neither the first generation, second generation, or the third generation Dodge Charger was a full frame vehicle. Therefore, the answer is false. In the case of our Mopars back in the 60s and the 70s and even the early 80s, the unibody takes the floor pan, the quarter panels, the front floor extensions, the upper deck filler panel, the rear package tray, the rear valance, the rear body panel, welds all these units together and collectively those make up the structural integrity of the vehicle. So basically the difference is a full frame vehicle would have had just that, a perimeter frame on the bottom and a body set down over the top. So why was it such a favorite in Hollywood if it wasn't the strongest car on the road? Because it was the best looking car on the road. Dodge Charger is the sleekest design of any car company in the history of the world. Visit graveyardcars.com to learn more. We finished building out the 426 Hemi for the 70 Charger RT. Before we can paint it, plumb it out, and fire it, I gotta go out and give the body men the green light on the 70 Charger that they just finished doing the pre-fit of the sheet metal on. It really is getting to be crunch time right now. We have a multitude of things going on simultaneously at the shop. Uh, I've got to go out and sign off on all the pre-fit and all the sheet metal on the 70 Charger RT so that they can start welding it up. The minute I do that, I can come back up and start prepping out the 426 Hemi to start putting the Street Hemi orange paint on it. Boy, it looks good. You got final zero on everything on the Eclipse Yeah, we did. You. It was, um, I think this was just zero, one, zero, but. God. Yeah, it's perfect. Well, the factory, if they got it within, I think it was a foot, they were making <laughs> right? oh, yeah. You Give or take a quarter inch. Look at some of those cars out back where these, especially this inside corner on a Charger, ask anybody that's ever built one of these, they got a glob of seam sealer. Right. I mean, that's how close they are. A glob literally six inches across of seam sealer. So I just did a quick follow up with the guys, see how they're doing on the Charger. They have all the AMD sheet metal in place, aligned to perfection. You're just cleaning up the corners now. We are. Okay. We got to put the corner pieces in as the last piece that we got to fit. Yeah, it goes on from the outside. Mm -hmm. 
So the next step is to give them the green light, which I've done, to disassemble it and start actually welding all the panels into place. So hopefully the next time we see it, it'll have a back end welded on and ready to start doing body work. Get it apart and start welding. You got my blessing. You need anything for me? Nope. You're the man. That's what I'm talking about. With the assembly done, it is now time to mask and paint the 426 Hemi for our 1970 Dodge Charger RT. So we're at the point now where the engine's ready to paint. All of the pieces that are supposed to go on the outside of it so that they can go orange are on and in place. The valve covers are masked off because they stay crinkle black. And we got it lifted up on the hoist. I've got the paint mixing right now inside. I'm gonna turn the booth on, warm everything up, and get ready to start painting. not too bad. For the most part, I've concentrated on the pits right here where all the rust was just over encumbered in this area. And I pretty much got a big brunt of it out, if not all of it. Now I'm gonna take it over and re-clean it, spray some chemicals on it and call it good. Okay, so I just got done blowing the K-member off and I needed to bring it over here to the solvent tank just to make sure I give it a, a once over get all the grease off, any kind of dust, dirt, whatever. Let all that stuff drain out for a bit and uh, it'll be good to go. Hand it off to Mark. I'm pretty excited here now. We've got the 426 Hemi for the 70 Charger RT completely assembled to the point where we can have it run on the engine run stand. We were very fortunate with the Hemi Charger. A lot of originality in it when we took it apart. The original AFB four barrel carburetors were still intact. They have numbers on them and they have date codes on them. When you hear numbers matching, it's not just the VIN, it's a lot of other little things. If everything's gonna match, those are the originals. That means they have to be restored with care. I only trust Scott Smith up at Harms auto. So we have all the corresponding gauges here. We can monitor everything. The only thing we have to do is roll it out into the shop, move it down to the end where the big door is because we don't want to start it inside with all the gas and the smoke and everything. You don't want to really run an engine without exhaust on it just because the cool air can go in there, back feed back up and possibly warp something that's really hot. Uh, and it's just smart. It's a spark arrestor. It keeps anything weird from happening. And batteries. Oh, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Back up, back up. We're grounding off on the battery. And batteries. Oh, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Back up, back up. We're grounding off on the battery. We're probably going to have to go higher with this system right here. I think we're too far forward. Fuck, I don't care where you go with it, but it Let's needs to it go high, you sucker. <laughs> <laughs> I think the mufflers are too heavy, so we need to pull it back more where the weight of the mufflers is. And dummy. Here, and when you do, it's still going to not be high enough. So why don't we cure both of them at the same time? Well, why don't we get taller jack stands? off. You're the ones that went and got them. Okay, what do you want me to do, buddy? Stupid Irrelevant piece of What's the problem, really? It's the technicality game with Darren. If I say, move the exhaust up, well, I didn't say move it up 12 degrees or I didn't move it up three and a half inches. He just yards it up in the air and holds it over his head or drops it to the ground. I don't have to be specific. Use your head. It's common sense. Did you not notice the Okay, exhaust? well, why can't I lift these up? The pipe right here, spark it. Okay. <laughs> We'll put something between it. Let's raise this up and just use this. Today's not going very good because Mark and Josh are just constantly going at it. And me, I'm just trying to be the neutral, be the, be the calm one. So we're doing really well. We've got literally everything on the motor and ready to fire up. We've got to put the battery charger on the battery because it's been setting for a few months since there was a motor on it running. Other than that, we're ready to hit the ignition and see where we're at. I really don't want to look like total f***ing idiots this year. The thing about the guys is, when the cameras aren't running on them, they actually do a good job. They follow instructions. That's how we get these things done. But when the cameras come out, it's like, you know what, Christmas time or at the holidays, when the nephew hears that somebody's got a camcorder and all of a sudden it's live from New York at Saturday night. You know, I'm, I'm a natural comedian. The, the, the wit and things like that, I was born with that. I, you can't just grab it and learn it. But they see that and they want to emulate me. Main power right here. We have good voltage. It's over 14 volts, that's good. It is on the battery charger. That'll probably go down really quickly. This is a big motor with a lot of compression, so it's gonna take a lot to turn it over. This is our oil pressure gauge, which is reading zero because we have not started the engine yet, but I did prime it yesterday and got this to run at a constant 60 pounds with just the drill hooked onto it. Uh, water temperature, again, if everything's cool, so it's setting down there at 100 degrees. We're gonna want it to run somewhere between 160 and 190. That would be a great operating temperature for this motor inside here. 
Um, the first thing we want to do is check for fuel leaks. So I'm going to turn the fuel pump on. I want you to watch. Oh, beautiful. Look at that. Looking good. Let's just see what we got. I'm going to crank it over without coil power right now, just so I can make sure everything's turning over like it should. Somebody fart. It's sulfating. You smell it? Yeah. The plates inside are shortened out, I think. I'm not sure, but all I know is it doesn't create any voltage. So every time, like right now, it's sitting there without the battery charger on it at 10 volts, so the battery's shot. Dad gum it. So you moose need to go down there. M O O N, that spells battery. We need one now. I am headed down to Napa to pick up a new battery. Hopefully, <laughs> we can get this thing running. The battery's under warranty, buddy. Battery's under warranty. The battery was not under warranty. Darren got me. Two points, Darren. Zero points, me. Half an hour to go get a battery three blocks down the road? Well, no, I don't need that. Look, guys, come on. Okay, we have no choke open. So far, so good. The choke's set up a little fat right now, meaning that it's a little rich. So I need to back it off just a little bit. So for me, the most rewarding thing is to know that we saved the motor, it's correct, and it is now ready to go back in the car. You know, Mark makes a big deal of painting exhaust manifolds. It just fills a shop full of pollutants and air, and we have to sit out there and breathe it. So I think it's totally wrong to paint the exhaust manifolds, because in the end, there's no paint on them anyway. I don't want money, and I don't want metals. What I want is to put these cars back on the road again the way they were the day they were built. First off, Mark cannot dance. He is not Michael Jackson. I think it's completely ridiculous, and it shouldn't be have any part on the show. When I get jazzed, when I get happy, when I get motivated, I dance. You don't like it? Too bad. It, it reminds me of the little town that didn't like the dancing going on, and, and Kevin Bacon came to town and had to explain to him that even David said, sing and dance before the Lord. Everything ran great. That's awesome. Nice work. Give it up. Do it, or I'll bash your head in. After the engine was assembled and ran, it just sounds wonderful and no problem with the engine. It's going to make the customer very happy. It just shows how well me and Mark work together. Very, very nice. You know, it was a very good week at Graveyard Cars. Mark and myself got the 426 Hemi engine together, got it running, no problem with the engine. The first time it's ran in 33 years. This season on Graveyard Cars, we have more cars than ever before. The Walton's 1972 Dodge Charger Rally, Kimberly Cook's 1970 Plymouth Barracuda Convertible, Mike Hill's 1970 Plymouth Superbird, the Daly's 1970 Plymouth Cuda, and the 1970 426 Hemi Dodge Charger RT, and the legendary 1969 Dodge Charger General Lee. With over 30 cars waiting in the wings, we're running out of room fast, which means it doesn't take much for squat dump and flush to back me in a corner. We have more cars to finish, more people watching, and more to lose if we fail. Welcome to Season 4 of Graveyard Cars. <laughs>